Hey, my name is Caitlin Bible, and this is my area presentation over cross-cultural psychology. A summative definition of cross-cultural psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and how cultural contexts influence that behavior. Culture in this context can be defined as values, beliefs, and practices of a group of people that are shared and passed down from generation to generation. One must also know the difference between race versus ethnicity to fully understand culture and the context of cross-cultural psychology. Race is defined as a group of people distinguished by similar and genetic physical characteristics, for example, white, black, or Hispanic. Ethnicity is defined as a cultural heritage, shared experiences, language, traditions, religion, and geographical territory shared among people of the same heritage. The history behind cross-cultural psychology starting with the major player in the field, the International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology, or IACCP. The IACCP was founded in 1972 following a large change in attention towards culture in psychology caused by numerous factors, including World War II reconstruction, international cooperation by the UN, and the emergence of civil and social unrest across multiple countries. For example, the rise of civil unrest in the United States around the 1950s and 60s regarding minority rights, specifically African American. In 1966 to 1971, there were three major international psychology conferences that were important for the development of cross-cultural psychology. The first conference was held in Hawaii in 1966, hosted by the Culture Learning Institute. This conference was titled Psychological Problems in Changing Societies and included approximately 22 psychologists from the United States and Pacific Rim countries. This conference was followed by a newsletter that included activities, plans, research, and other news in regards to the psychologists that had attended. The second conference, held in Ibadan from December of 1966 to January of 1967, included 50 scholars from Western and African countries. This conference was hosted by the University of Ibadan and was designed to bring together psychologists and social scientists from Africa and Western countries to develop research collaboration among their cultures. The cross-cultural Sci social psychology newsletter was created from this conference and is later known as the cross-cultural psychology bulletin, which included abstracts and other news regarding things discussed at the conference. The last pivotal conference was the Istanbul Conference in 1971. It was sponsored by the NATO Advisory Panel on Human Factors and covered topics of mental tests, culture and cognition, and cross-cultural methodology, as well as testing and assessment, research strategies, and educational intervention. Cross-cultural psychology mainly began emerging in the 60s, along with the previously mentioned conferences. This emergence sparked the need for an organization to allow researchers and psychologists across the world who were interested in the field to begin collaborating. Thus became the International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology established by John Dawson. Dawson was born and raised in Sydney, Australia, and received his bachelor's from the University of California, succeeded by his degree in anthropology from Oxford University. He then went on to lecture social change with cross-cultural interests as a professor at the University of Sydney, and he was later appointed Chair of Psychology at the University of Hong Kong, where the inaugural conference of IACCP was also held. Activities of the IACCP include their main goal of inclusivity of all cultures and psychological perspectives internationally. They also had regional representatives that were equally distributed across the cultural regions. Originally, there were only six representatives for the major culture areas, Africa, Circa Mediterranean, East Eurasia, Insular Pacific, North American, and South American. However, since the creation of IACCP, there have been more members added to represent the smaller subcultural regions. The IACCP has a fee structure for membership that is inclusive to varying nations' income, 
and they also offer travel assistance and other support networks, especially for young psychologists seeking to be members. Lastly, the culture of IACCP is aimed towards collegiate collaboration, as well as receptiveness to new ideas and new members from varying cultural backgrounds with varying perspectives. Shifting from history to the major terms and concepts found in cross-cultural psychology, starting with the basic theories, relativism, absolutism, and universalism. Relativism theorizes that psychological characteristics are molded by culture, meaning behaviors can be analyzed by primarily looking at an individual's cultural background. Absolutism states that psycho psychological characteristics are essentially the same across all cultures. For example, anxiety is anxiety regardless of cultural background. Lastly, universalism theorizes that basic psychological processes are similar among species, for example, humans, and cultural influence, culture influences psychological characteristics. Universalism can be seen as the combination of relativism and absolutism. Some approaches to cross-cultural psychology are the etic and emic approaches. The etic approach finds commonalities across cultures and applies a universal set of concepts to all cultures, whereas the emic approach applies more specific concepts to the culture being observed. A combined etic emic approach can also be used, and a less popular approach to cross cultural psychology is the ethnocentric approach. Ethnocentrism uses the observer's personal culture as the standard when evaluating other cultures. Clearly, this is the less popular as we have learned more about other cultures and see how that is considered bias rather than an approach to study. Other approaches to cross-cultural psychology are evolutionary, sociological, and eco-cultural. The evolutionary approach looks at evolutionary factors and their effect on human behavior and culture. Under this approach, culture is a part of existence and simply provides for human needs. Second, the sociological approach looks at social structures and their influence on individuals, society, and culture. Under this approach, culture is a product of human activity and interaction. Lastly, the eco-cultural approach believes that the individual cannot be separated from environmental context, specifically ecological and sociopolitical. The ecological context includes economic activity of a society, such as proper food and nutrition, availability of heat or cooling, and population density. The sociopolitical context is the extent to which an individual participates in global and or local decisions. I want to discuss a general framework introduced by cultural psychologist Dr. John Barry called the Eco-Cultural Framework. This framework helps understanding of human behavior across various cultures with both individual and group adaptations. It takes into account different variables and contexts to compare and contrast behavior and experience across all cultures. It is a summative way to derive hypotheses in relation to cross-cultural psychology studies, and it also includes some of the context mentioned in the previous slide. Cultural transmission refers to the process by which features of a culture are given to individual members of that culture. There are two main types of cultural transmission, enculturation and socialization. Enculturation is when developing members are surrounded by models of the culture and behavior that is then transmitted onto them, and socialization is when the behavior of developing members are shaped through instruction. These, process, these processes take place entirely in the heritage culture of the developing members, and when the transmission process takes place outside of that heritage culture, it is referred to as acculturation. Acculturation can be defined as changes at the individual level or group slash cultural level as a result of contact with other cultural groups. When these changes happen at the individual level, it is referred to as psychological acculturation, and when it occurs at the group level, it is simply called group level acculturation.
Here is a short clip from a lecture given by Dr. Berry just last year in 2022, explaining acculturation further using another general framework that he has created. The main concepts employed in this research are acculturation and intercultural relations. Acculturation is defined as the process of cultural and psychological change that results from contact between different cultural groups and their individual members. These cultural changes in groups and psychological changes in their members present challenges and opportunities very often, but over time, cultural and psychological adaptations uh, emerge that may lead to either positive or negative intercultural relations. These adaptations are often linked to a particular experience of individuals make it, making it possible to identify which of these experiences will promote or perhaps undermine personal well-being and positive relations. So when we want to study these issues, it's useful to have a map of the variables that uh, we're concerned with. And uh, over the years, I have evolved this framework that uh, deals with core concepts and relationships amongst them in the domains of acculturation and intercultural relations. And so this framework shows on the left that we have some important information to gather from the cultural groups in contact. In the minimal case, we have two cultures, A and B, are in contact with each other, and they produce cultural changes in organization, structure, economic activity, and so on in both these cultures. So we need to understand the features of culture A and culture B that are brought to the contact situation. We need to understand the nature of the contact, whether it's invasion or uh, a less uh, negative form of contact. And we need to examine what changes have taken place at the cultural level as a result of this contact. This information at the group or cultural level uh, provides the uh, context for us to study the psychological or individual level <clears throat> features over on the right hand side. And here we have uh, two main sets of variables. One we call psychological acculturation and the other we call adaptation. Here we study samples of individuals in both cultures or more usually and we look at their behavioral changes. How do they change their attitudes and behaviors in day-to-day -day life? What uh, are the stress reactions, the acculturative stress uh, to any challenges that are experienced? And then we also look at the strategies, the way individuals come to understand how they might try to live together in the uh, plural society. <laughs> On the right-hand side, we have uh, the eventual long-term adaptations where people settle into a way of living more or less successfully. And we have three kinds of adaptation that have been examined in the literature. Sociocultural, that is doing well, such as at work or at school or engaging in social um, uh, uh, relationships. Psychological, that is feeling well, uh, uh, personal well-being, uh, good mental health, high self-esteem and so on. And thirdly, intercultural, uh, this is achieving a level of tolerance and low level of prejudice uh, and something we call a multicultural ideological orientation uh, to uh, other groups in the uh, diverse society. So I have just gone through these uh, components and uh, these next slides show them in a little bit more detail but I think that the overall picture is fairly clear. The group level variables provide the context for the interpretation. The psychological level variables uh, shown over on the right. Wrapping up acculturation, I wanted to mention the acculturation strategies, assimilation, integration, separation, and marginalization. Assimilation is when an individual does not wish to maintain their current heritage culture and rather chooses to seek out other cultures instead. 
Integration refers to when an individual does want to maintain their current culture, but they also seek out other cultures as well. Separation is when an individual wants to continue maintaining their current culture and they avoid all other larger societies. And finally, marginalization is when an individual does not maintain their current culture and they also choose not to participate in any other cultures either. Piggybacking off of acculturation is intercultural contact. Prejudice refers to the negative judgment towards a cultural group that is not one's own. One attempt to reduce prejudice is the contact hypothesis that states more contact between different cultural groups will create more positive cultural attitudes. Cultural attitudes are the positive or negative evaluations of members of a cultural group. Discrimination, similar to prejudice, is negative behaviors towards a cultural group separate from one's own. Where prejudice refers to the negative judgments, discrimination refers to negative behavior slash actions. Lastly, stereotypes is the generaliza generalization about a cultural group separate from one's own. Individualism and collectivism. Individualism and collectivism evaluate the individual's primary concern for either themselves or the groups they are involved with. Individualism is the motivation by an individual to choose their personal preferences, needs, and rights rather than the preferences, needs, and rights of a group they are a part of. A great example of individualistic culture can be seen here in the United States where we do tend to prioritize ourselves and our own needs over that of our family, friends, etc. In contrast, you have collectivism, where the individual is motivated by their group's preferences, needs, and rights rather than their own. For example, Chinese culture tends to prioritize helping their loved ones over tending to their own personal matters. Cultural identity development refers to the stages of one's life where they recognize their culture in comparison to other cultures and come to terms with the culture that they identify with. Cultural identity development is not exclusive to just minorities. However, it is a more prevalent issue for minority cultures in nations where there is a clear majority. The form of minority cultural, cultural identity development I have shown here in this slide was formed around African American minorities in the United States. Starting with the pre-encounter stage, this is the feeling that the world around you is organized according to the dominant culture rather than one's own culture. This is the first step. And then next is the encounter stage, which is the confrontation of reality of the de-evaluation of one's own culture. Then the immersion stage is where the individual completely involves oneself with their cultural group. And lastly, the internalization stage is the feeling of comfort with one's own cultural identity. As I mentioned, this is one example of cultural identity development in minorities, but there are different ways and types of cultural identity development for all cultures, including European or white identity, which is typically referred to as the majority, especially when we're talking about the United States. Moving on to research in the area of cross-cultural psychology, starting with research goals. The main goals of research in cross-cultural psychology are to describe, interpret, predict, and manage. Describing being the comparison of psychological factors regarding certain aspects of behavior within two or more cultures. Then interpreting or explaining possible correlations between those factors and behaviors attempting to predict behaviors using research findings, and lastly, attempting to apply those findings in real-world settings. Looking at one example of modern research in cross-cultural psychology, I found a 2022 study done by Fritas et al. that examined age-related variations of gratitude in children ages 7 to 14, located in Brazil, Russia, China, South Korea, Turkey, and the United States. 
The children in the United States were expected to show less gratitude than children in all five of the other regions due to the prediction that those regions have a stronger feeling of being helped and therefore they were predicted to reciprocate with more gratitude. This study found that North American children reported lower feelings of being helped compared to the other five regions, which was as to be expected. It also found that children from China, Russia, South Korea, and Turkey expressed concrete and connective gratitude at a significantly different extent than the children from the US, where children from Brazil only expressed concrete gratitude at a significantly different rate than their US counterparts. Concrete gratitude being when the child reciprocates with an item that they enjoy, like candy, and connective being when the child reciprocates with an item they think the receiver would enjoy. Lastly, verbal gratitude, or the simple expression of thanks, did not vary clearly among the regions. And then older children were more likely to show gratitude than the younger age children across the regions. Here is one graph from the research study on age and society's effects on gratitude. This bar chart shows the percentage of verbal, concrete, and connective gratitude expressed by each society without taking into account age variations. Solely looking at society slash culture in terms of verbal gratitude, Brazil is the leading nation, followed by Russia and then the United States. The percent of verbal gratitude is very close for each country, but South Korea appears to fall behind in this section. Moving on to concrete, the United States has the highest percentage by far, with Brazil falling behind and the other nations falling even lower. Lastly, connective gratitude shows China is the top percentage with Turkey slightly below and the United States and Brazil falling way behind with this form of gratitude. Keep in mind this graph was made with the results from all children ages 7 to 14 in each nation. In the next slide, I will show some graphs that represent the age groups as well. Here we have the age breakdowns for each type of gratitude. First, looking at verbal gratitude, again, it can be seen here why they concluded that verbal gratitude did not vary clearly. In this graph, we can see that Brazilian children were consistently more likely to express verbal gratitude starting around age nine compared to other nations such as South Korea that started out strong, but then has consistently lower rates starting at age nine. Looking at the graphs for concrete and connective, it is interesting to note that there seems to be strong similarity uh, among all of the nations. Looking at figure four, there is a downward trend for each of these lines and figure five has more of an upward trend. Looking deeper into each of these graphs and the numbers behind them, there are some more obvious differences, but at a glance, the United States was not extremely different from other nations in terms of gratitude expression as it was hypothesized to be. This research shows the importance of cross-cultural psychology as the field dives into the similarities and differences between cultures and how to use those findings for the benefit of all societies. Although this research only covers gratitude, you can imagine the various other issues in terms of social, environmental, biological, and many more areas of life that have been or need to be studied in order to properly assess and care for the psychological well-being of various cultures. Cross-cultural psychology is a relatively new field of psychology. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the field itself emerged in the 1960s and was officially organized in the early 70s. It has grown tremendously within the past few decades to allow for a better understanding of psychology in the terms of various cultures, as well as because of society in general growing to connect with, integrate, and appreciate the surrounding cultures. Um, that's all for my presentation. I do really appreciate you taking the time to watch and I look forward to getting your questions and answering them.